All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I have, I feel like Charlie in the chocolate factory. There is, I have, you know, so much to see, so little time. Uh, and we got this new high-tech uh, presentation, which will allow me to freeform. Also, uh, I have some new information. Uh, my boss gave me the, his PowerPoint slide presentation on Monday, and it, I was embargoed uh, to show this to anybody until five o'clock yesterday when he made an announcement uh, about the asteroid recovery mission that he's the project manager of. So I have some new information about the uh, asteroid recovery mission. So we'll get through, through part of this. Uh, what I'm gonna do is, because it is free form, I'm probably gonna do it like in a trilogy of three, like Star Wars. So I'm gonna start with today, maybe go back in time, and then go to the future spacecraft that we have. Uh, unless I feel like I'm running out of time, then I'm just going to go back to the future. <laughs> See what I did. <laughs> so uh, my name is Charles White, and I play Max Singularity uh, on, on EVE Online. Just an informal character that kind of had a grudge against Jamil Sorum II. Uh, he mourned Jamil Sorum I when she passed 2004 when the players saw her corpse from the first Amar Championships, and uh, I even spoke to the CCP dev uh, pilot that actually flew Jamil in the first Amar Championships. And so there was an inquisition underway. Uh, so, but unfortunately the drifters took her out and she didn't face my inquisition. But hopefully we don't see a Jamil Sorum three or some drifter abomination of her. Uh, at at JPL, I've, I've had a, a wonderful career at JPL. Uh, 28 years working at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, I am a knowledge management specialist. And what that is, is um, uh, we all have knowledge, but how do we codify and how do we keep that knowledge uh, for the institution? Because when everybody goes home, all the bricks and mortar have, have no knowledge. But there are institutional ways to take care of that knowledge. We have a lessons learned system. So every time we make a mistake, we don't ask who did it, we ask what did it. And then we write that down and we put that. So I'm a member of the lessons learned committee. We have social sharing where we take uh, cross-generational gen cross uh, engineers, younger engineers, and team them up with older engineers. We have mentoring programs. We have all kinds of stuff. So this is all part of knowledge management. And I've been very fortunate that I've had uh, support roles on many of the multi-missions. So I'm kind of one of those jack of all trades, but master of none. And so uh, I won't be able to get into specifics or uh, details of that. Um, if you ask, I, I learned that in knowledge management, I don't know is a valid answer. So this is where I work and uh, we wear badges uh, we are, uh, there's the JPL logo. I need to get away from the light. How many here saw the Martian? All right, that's my people. <laughs> all right. So you probably saw JPL featured all throughout the Martian and even more so in the book. Uh, we are a very unique uh, institution. Uh, we, we were there at the beginning of NASA and we are a contractor for NASA. Uh, we are their, uh, uh, their FFRDC, the Federally Funded Research and Development Center uh, for NASA. So we have a very close relationship. So when we say NASA, JPL, it's, it's kind of like one word. So here's where I'm gonna go in this awesome presentation directly to today. Dun, 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 dun. And I want to start off with a video that gets me every single time. Uh, this, this was an amazing event in 2012 when we landed the uh, Curiosity rover uh, on Mars. So I, this to me was one of those where were you when this landed. So this video kind of sums up uh, the amazing tension and the excitement. <laughs> Things are looking good, coming up on the tree. It will report to entry interface. At this time, it will begin pressurizing the propulsion system to increase the thrust of the system. Uh, we'll use that for all the maneuvering in the atmosphere we're about to do. We're 
Soldier standing by for guidance start, start of guided entry. That's where I was, I was in one of those. Watching. We are beginning to feel the atmosphere as we go in here. Vehicles just reported via tones that it has started guided entry. At this time, the vehicle is beginning to steer its way to the target. We have seen peak deceleration. That is starting its first bank reversal. Uh, it is reporting that we are seeing G's on the order of uh, 11 to 12 Earth T's. Bank reversal 2 is starting. We are now getting telemetry from Odyssey. We should have parachute deploy around Mach 1.7. Parachute is deployed. We are decelerating. Sea chill step has separated where we found the ground. We're down to 90 meters per second at an altitude of 6.5 kilometers per second. Standing by for batch shell separation. We are in powered flight. We're at an altitude of 1 kilometer descending. Standing by for sky crane. Sky crane is started. Single to us, he remains strong. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. Today, right now, the wheels of curiosity have begun to blaze the trail for human footprints on Mars. This is an amazing achievement. Well, today on Mars, history was made on Earth. The successful landing of curiosity marks what is really an unprecedented technological tour de force. It will stand as an American point of pride far into the future. Well, tonight was, was a great drama that was played. I could only think of the words of Teddy Roosevelt as I was sitting there. It is far better to dare mighty things even though we might fail than to stay in a twilight that knows neither victory nor defeat. <laughs> Gets me every time, so I'm a little choked up. Uh, the reason why it's so emotional for us is because these missions take six years of planning. And we put our heart and our soul and everything we know into these missions. And we've never done this before. It's corny, but we literally are going where no one has ever gone before. And we're doing things that nobody has ever done before. And unfortunately, we can't you know, go to the universities and the colleges and say, hi, we need an entry descent landing engineer, an EDL engineer, because they don't exist. So this is why this is, why this is very powerful to me as a knowledge manager, because we have to uh, train uh, those people. So, so this is uh, Mars. Uh, Curiosity is still going very good. I got a chance to uh, uh, live with the Mars drivers on a 10-hour shift. Uh, on Sol 1073. So if you look, 
If you look on the archives on the internet, at Seoul 1074, you'll see that the rover went over a, an unnamed boulder, which I call Max Singularity, so <laughs> you, you can see that. Uh, so, so presently, so here's the state of the fleet. So I like starting with that video because it really just kind of shows you, you know, the passion and what we're doing. Um, presently, we have Mars Odyssey. Uh, Mars Odyssey is, is an orbiter, and it's, ex it's uh, exploring the, uh, uh, the canyons and the surface uh, of, of Mars. Uh, this is a place called the Pahrump Hills. Uh, and then we also have the Opportunity Rover. And the Opportunity Rover uh, uh, shows some of the ancient sand dunes. And you can see quite a variance in the type of terrain uh, that we had to navigate through. And then, of course, we have Curiosity that, that I just showed you. Uh, also in space right now, uh, not only do we have uh, our Mars missions, but we also, let me hit this thing. Uh, we also have Exploring Earth. Uh, we have several ish, uh, missions going on right now. So uh, we have a, uh, on the International Space Station, uh, we have a device that looks at the, the winds uh, and, and uh, over, the, over the seas, and so that tells us uh, a lot about the Earth. And we can get some, uh, another spacecraft mission is uh, GRACE, and this uh, shows us the differences in gravity around the Earth, because gravity isn't the same uh, wherever you go. Uh, we also have a couple missions that look CloudSat that looks at uh, water content. Uh, Jason, uh, Oko looks at our orbit, uh, our ca carbon, uh, and then this one I wanted to rush to. Uh, this one is uh, Snap, and this is a new mission right now that is looking at uh, soil moisture uh, on the planet. And so this one is really important because this is the first time ever we've had this ability to look at how much water is in the dirt. SMAP is a acronym for Soil Moisture Active Passive. It's a, it's a satellite that uh, studies the Earth's moisture content, where it is, where it comes from, where it goes. Every three days, we'll have a soil moisture map of the entire Earth. And it will allow scientists to track water availability around the globe, which will also help in guiding policy decisions. So not just near, near Earth, we're also going beyond Earth and we're leaving the local area. So uh, in 2004, the Cassini mission uh, uh, arrived at Saturn. Uh, we have Juno also uh, on its way to uh, uh, Jupiter right now. Uh, we have the Dawn, which uses an ion engine. Uh, let's take a look at that. Okay, let's not take a look at that. Uh, Dawn has the ability to, uh, uh, it uses an ion engine, uh, which basically uses electricity and it pushes out ions a very small amount, but that small amount is still measurable and it allows us to, uh, uh, to get a little bit of thrust uh, by not carrying so much fuel. So there still is an act, uh, an act uh, I can't say it can't pronounce it. There's an activator type fuel that's carried on, but it, you, it only requires very little uh, quantity of that uh, fuel in order to, to work. Uh, the Voyager spacecraft. The Voyager missions uh, were very special to me because Voyager 1 and 2, uh, they, were, they were launched basically when I was in high school. And uh, when I was going through college, they were at uh, Jupiter and Saturn. And when I got out of college, uh, they, were at, they were at Uranus. And then I got hired at JPL, and I actually got to help participate on the Voyager as they passed ne Neptune uh, on the team. And so now, uh, 29 years later, the Voyager spacecraft are right now on the edge of this area here, which is what we call the heliopause. And we just got indication within this last year that they're in free interstellar, interstellar space for the very first time. Oh. 
They are the, the farthest man-made objects. Uh, uh, and they have a gold disc on them that was made by Carl Sagan. And it's actually instructions. And uh, there's like 30-some uh, uh, different languages of greetings from the people of planet Earth uh, on audio files. And, and, and uh, in order, we didn't have the memory chips or anything then, but we had this gold record. And this gold record will last a couple billion years in space. So we had to include a needle to play on this record player <laughs> because uh, we had no way to give the aliens instructions, but we gave them enough instructions to decode that so, so they, they, were, uh, they would ab absolutely figure it out. Uh, so we tested this. We sent it to like 10 universities around the world and eight universities figured it out. Don't go to the other two. Uh, so also, uh, way out in, in beyond Earth, uh, we have some observatories that are going on. And so Spitzer, Kepler, and New Star, uh, these are all uh, uh, observatories that are not like the Hubble. They're looking in the infrared or they're looking in the X-ray. Now, where is Hubble on this? Well, Hubble is not directly a JPL mission. So what I'm doing is I'm giving you a, a, a state of the fleet from the JPL, uh, not all of NASA. So, there, so Hubble is a NASA mission. However, JPL did participate with, the, with Hubble uh, because what we did is we added the, uh, uh, the telescope. Uh, when they launched Hubble, they ground the mirror at a wrong angle, and they didn't know that until they opened the lens and took the first picture. Uh, so what we did is we basically made a new camera and put a contact lens in it. And so we fixed, uh, fixed it so it would be able to uh, give us the p beautiful pictures. But that's, even though it's an ongoing mission, I didn't include it in the today because that was something we did a while ago. So when I go back in time, I'll show you some of those. So we have uh, Spitzer, Kepler, and New Star. Kepler is pretty interesting because Kepler is the one that's discovering all these new uh, exoplanets. So these are kind of, when I see these, I think of Eve. You know, it was like, oh yeah, <laughs> I'm actually there. <laughs> um, so it's kind of, it's kind of fun. Uh, we've been coming out with uh, some of these graphics that, uh, that, that are these really neat posters that are coming up. Because uh, we're looking for planets that are in the habitable zone. So it's an area that's not too close to the sun that it would bake and not too far that it would totally freeze. We're looking for that, that habitable zone. And it differs on the different size of stars. So some stars that are very large, very hot, that zone's going to be much farther out. Some stars that are very small, that's going to be much farther in. And so we're looking, we're looking at those stars. So you may have heard in the news that uh, uh, the alien structures were found over an orbiting star. Let me see a show of hands how many heard that story. Okay, yeah, wow, that got pervasive out there. Um, my personal opinion is, no, it's not a Dyson sphere, uh, but it, it's probably something that we have never seen before in a solar system dynamic. So uh, it's pretty exciting. So there's a lot of telescopes that are now, uh, it, it's got our attention. Uh, but is it aliens? I, I don't think so. Uh, look how hard it is to make uh, our citadel structures, let alone an entire <laughs> ring around a star. So if anybody can understand the complexity, it's us. <laughs> uh, new star also uh, looking at uh, x-rays that are given off uh, on, on the sun. So this, I'm going to also talk about, let's see, did I skip over it? Oh, no, because we're going to talk about tomorrow, but not yet. Let's take a quick path to yesterday. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the past, because I want to tell you all about ARM. Uh, but basically, JPL was founded in, in 1936 and by a group we called the Suicide Squad, which was Frank Molino, uh, Ed Foreman, Jack Parsons, uh, Rudolph Scott, and Apollo Milton. Uh, these guys basically took uh, just a couple hundred dollars out of their own pocket, and they started doing rocket experiments uh, in a field 
which is in the Arroyo Seco, which is a dry riverbed uh, in Pasadena. Now, why were they in the dry riverbed? Well, they were playing in Caltech in a lab, and they caused a huge rocket fuel explosion that blew out all the windows in the building and about all the houses within a half a mile. And they, were, they basically told them, go away, go play. In 1936, there were no houses uh, here, and so they, they started doing experiments uh, for the first rocket test. So now, when we got into the 1940s and 41, uh, we got that rocket technology down. And we also were very good at uh, inventing the solid rocket. So the liquid fuel and the solid rockets, uh, we improved upon quite a bit. And so if you've ever gone to an air show and you've seen the Blue Angels and they have Fat Albert and it takes off, uh, that's, yeah, those are fun. Uh, that is a technology invented by JPL, which is the JATO uh, model. So here are two airplanes racing each other, one without a JATO and one with. And you can see it gets right up into, into the Air Force. And so this was at a very early time, and that got the attention. I mean, this is 1941. This got the attention because what's happening in 41 it was going to war. Uh, so the Army came in and said, hey, you guys, uh, Caltech, you know, maybe you can uh, make some stuff for us uh, to help with the war effort. So that's when JPL was founded, right there. That was the, the, the uh, one of the guys, Frank Molina, right there, who signed the first uh, contract with the Army. And we started working on uh, smaller missiles. Uh, we worked on the private and the corporal, uh, and these were, these were uh, short-range nuclear missiles. So they were basically uh, nuclear hand grenades, if you think about it, it's kind of scary. Uh, they were short range about maybe 50 to 80 miles uh, that, that they would fly. So you could basically launch it and you could see uh, exactly right from where you, uh, where you were. But there was kind of a problem with it. Like I said, it was, uh, you know, you put a nuclear warhead on one of these things. And it's like, run? There's a five mile blast radius, uh, run? So in our early uh, history, uh, we did have some failures, but JPL, again, did not suffer the, you did this wrong. We always looked at it as what went wrong. And that's why we started our lessons learned programs. And we started learning from our mistakes and uh, you know, trying to figure out what was happening. Uh, then Russia uh, launched Sputnik, and Sputnik was a simple radio beeper. That's all it was, it was just a, uh, a, a radio transmitter thrown in space. And it would just put, a, put out a simple beep beep tone. A, a, but they published on the newspapers the AM radio, so you turn like the AM 540 on your radio. And then all of a sudden, you know, a hobbyist would say, hey Mildred, come up, let's listen to Sputnik. Beep, 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 beep. That's a Russian bomb right there. That did a lot to panic everyone. Uh, there's, you go up on YouTube and, and, and watch what, you know, the, the story of what Sputnik did to America. Uh, it just so happened that JPL was already planning a mission very similar to this, but it wasn't a radio beeper, it was actually a real science mission. And uh, this spacecraft- At the National uh, Academy of Science, exhausted as they were, the trio obliged with what was to be the page one spread in newspapers all over the world. In plain language, the United States was in the space business along with the Russians, and Explorer One was the beginning. So that's uh, some pretty famous people on there. That's uh, uh, Pickering, I don't know the guy in the middle, but that's also Werner Braun Brown. Uh, that's on there, because we used his rocket to get, to get us up there uh, and going. So. So that was the very early part of our, our space program. And we also started working on our first space probe. In 1962, we sent a probe that just flew past uh, Venus. Uh, Venus is still very interesting. Uh, you talk about uh, 
global warming. Uh, global warming, Venus is basically what happens is if we lose control of this planet, we could become like Venus. Uh, Venus is so hot, uh, basically there's molten lead on the surface. Uh, that's that's melted so and the reason for that is the atmosphere is so thick and it just developed more and more greenhouse gases over time uh, we were pretty well celebrated uh, because that was the first time we ever went to another planet so it was kind of neat then we decided well if we can go to another planet maybe we could hit the moon uh, with a spacecraft and yes I said hit the moon <laughs> because uh, it, it was kind of a challenge to, to get us. So the first six attempts to go to the moon failed. We couldn't hit the broad side of the moon. <laughs> and the term, you know, you guys don't know what you're doing came up. And as a knowledge manager, that's alarming to me. You know, when someone says you don't know what you're doing. So luckily on the seventh mission, uh, we launched. Uh, Stand by for this is how it went. Seconds to impact. Quite a difference good. from Excellent the uh, Mars mission. Three, two, one. Impact. Impact has occurred at 132550. All video data was excellent right <laughs> up to impact. All cameras were functioning. Transmitters were functioning properly. Still and just as exciting. Oh, Roger. Just hitting the moon uh, took a lot because we were dealing with. Uh, we didn't have computers like you have now. We didn't have uh, the radio systems that, that we have now. We didn't have the same telemetry. Um, we couldn't get images coming back. Luckily, because it was the moon, uh, we had a, a short distance to, to get that uh, information back. Uh, so so it, was, it was kind of pretty cool. Uh, then uh, we went, took another spacecraft in 1965, and we went by Mars for the first time. Now. I love this one because for many, many years I passed this uh, poster on the wall and I kept looking at the poster that was behind glass and, and it was strips of adding machine paper. And my boss was John Cassani, who's a well-known uh, JPLer and uh, project manager. And uh, I caught him in the hallway and I said, John, can you tell me the story about this? It was wonderful. He took about 40 minutes and told me the full story. Here's going to be the brief story for you. After what seemed an eternity, Mariner 4 began transmitting back images. Two or three of us who had worked on the tape recorder came up with these schemes of how to try to sketch out the data in real time as it came in. And it was essentially our adding machine paper tapes tacked to a wall. And we created an image that way That's on Jeff paper Sonny. faster than they could reconstruct a, a picture in a computer. <laughs> the picture was going to take two days in our computers at the time. It would have taken two days for them. But the data was coming right down right now. So the guys were like, man, we got to show the press something. What are we going to do? So they said, too bad. You know, you got to wait two days. But uh, the other guys off in the corner just started doing this, and they were just like, screw this. We're going to color this in. <laughs> we want to see what's going on. And so that's the actual picture. And uh, it's actually, uh, it was one of those things that recently was rediscovered, and now it's out on display, and it travels around. But it is kind of a, a neat thing. Uh, then we went to, to not just pass by the moon and hit the moon, now we wanted to soft land on the moon because there was some talk that uh, the moon is nothing but a layer of dust over the billion years. Tidal forces from the earth would cause the rocks to move back and forth and it just make dust and dust. So when the spacecraft lands, they'll actually <laughs> sink into the dust. And it was kind of a valid concern. Uh, so we sent a couple surveyor spacecraft and uh, this, uh, uh, this was Apollo 12. It was the first time a human crew actually met up with a JPL spacecraft uh, in space. 400, 400 feet. This was the first landing. 200 feet. This was our graphics at the time. 13 feet per second speed. Touch the bus feet. 
we didn't have the cameras live. We couldn't do it live. So it was just this paper model landing on a paper background. In its first picture from the moon, Surveyor took a self-portrait. After adjustment of exposure, the lunar cyclops turned its eye to examine the ground beneath its path. <laughs> so uh, again, we did a couple more flybys of Mars, and we started getting uh, better pictures of, of Mars. Um, then we went into uh, Mariner 9 in the early uh, uh, 70s, and Mariner 10. Uh, these are also headed out of the solar system, doing pretty good. But again, my favorite was, uh, uh, well, I love the Vikings uh, as well, but the, uh, uh, the Voyager spacecraft. Let's see, let's go back. Where are we? Voyagers are coming up. Here they are. Oh, CSAT was cool. Uh, I remember CSAT because I was in high school again. And when CSAT came out, this was the first time we actually could look under the uh, water and actually see the ocean bottoms. So all those, all those maps you see on Google Earth and all that, that's all maps from uh, CSAT. And, uh, so, but again, the Voyager 2 mission was just uh, uh, the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Uh, this was the first time and the only time we could do the grand tour by using a gravity assist uh, with the power available which meant with one mission, we could use Jupiter's gravity in what's called a slingshot, a gravity slingshot, and then that would propel us to Saturn because Saturn would be in the right place, and then that would propel us by Saturn, and that would give us a huge slingshot so we could go to Uranus, and then from Uranus we could head to Neptune. And so I used Uranus when I'm talking to kids, but I use Uranus when I'm talking to you. Jupiter's atmosphere displays a dazzling variety of alternating patterns. Cold, light-colored zones dominated by ammonia ice crystals in the higher altitudes, and warmer, dark belts of solid sulfurous particles in the lower altitudes. Voyager's cameras afforded scientists spectacular close-up views of the Great Red Spot, a storm three times the diameter of Earth raging in Jupiter's atmosphere. This was the first time we ever saw Jupiter this up close. Yeah, this, this wasn't that long ago, people. Not that long ago. And if you think about it, when we saw the first pictures of Saturn, all of that has occurred within my lifetime and most of yours. If you think about it, from a thousand years from now, they're going to look back at this age, this 50 years of space flight from where we had, uh, or 100 if you want to include, you know, the Wright brothers uh, airplane, they're going to look at this brief time and they're going to say this was the golden age of solar system exploration. It was the first time we saw all these images. It's like, wow, it's so awesome. People say, do you want to live in the future? I'm going, you know, I'm doing okay right now. I'm, I'm not doing so bad. Uh, and, there, and there's more to come. Uh, 81, we went by Saturn. We saw some new moons. I'm checking my time because I want to make sure I get to some of this. This is where we went uh, to Uranus uh, and then off to Neptune uh, in 89. So I started working at JPL right here. So that was the beginning of uh, my career there. Uh, Magellan, uh, once I was working there, I was actually not a senior employee that I am now. Uh, I was basically uh, working for the Flight Project Support Office just doing some remedial uh, data entry tasks. Uh, but I had a hobby on the side. And the hobby on the side was I composed music. And JPL was producing some documentaries at the time using some canned music that was just thrown on top because that's not our focus uh, at the time. And so I actually asked the production crew, can I contribute uh, one of my works to, uh, to one of your broadcasts? So they actually brought the tapes from Magellan and they handed it to me. And so at my home, I got a chance to look at this on a little, a little, on a three quarter inch tape uh, player. And I played it on a video and I sat there with my keyboard and I composed some music uh, for, for this. Uh, here is just a quick sample.
Then a quick flight to the east brings us to the mouth of an extraordinary 600 mile long rift valley. We arrive at another volcano named Gula. Here we skim its mile-high summit and descend to view the lava flows and ridged terrain of its northwestern face. A volcanic caldera now in sight is further evidence of Venus's active geologic history. <laughs> that was my music. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, as you looked at Venus there, uh, it, what's interesting about that is uh, because Venus is so hot, uh, because Venus is so hot, so on Earth, uh, when you look at a mountain, let's say the mountain's like this, uh, the scientists and geologists call this the angle of repose. So the angle of repose uh, varies on the type of material. If it's sandy, it's less. If it's rocky, it's more. But the angle of repose is, is pretty much consistent for Earth. On Venus, the angle of repose is it's much less because the rocks are so much hotter. Uh, everything just is, it flows much, much less. So when you see that video of those mountain peaks, it, we could hardly tell anything from the data because everything just looked kind of smooth. So by using computer vertical uh, exaggeration, we exaggerate it to make it look Earth-like. Uh, but when you see stuff like that, a lot of uh, visualizations, uh, the, the exaggeration is often uh, put up. So when put up higher so you can see the difference. So bear that in mind when you see uh, when we release press releases that you know, the, the information is, is exaggerated on purpose so you can see it. Uh, so this is, uh, this is what I was telling you about Hubble because we, uh, when we fixed the Hubble telescope, uh, it was just amazing to see these old men, these pillars, places where stars were created. things go boom. Oh yeah, EVE Online. Uh, if you think this is awesome, just wait, 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 wait. So not JPL, we're not doing it, but uh, an, one of the other NASA centers is working on the James uh, Webb Telescope. Oh my God. This thing is like six times larger than the Hubble Space Telescope. So the amount of light that it's going to gather and we're going to get from that thing, and it's adaptive optics too. The, the optics are able to adjust so they can fix the focus on the fly up there. So, I'm sorry? Yes. Yeah, it'll be, it, it'll be an orbital scope. Uh, I believe, I might have to, the answer is I don't know, but I think it actually is going to be trailing like at the L5 position on the Earth. So the problem is with Hubble, it, it has to observe and then it has to not observe because you know, unless it's looking north, you know, uh, but, but when it's way out there, it'll be able to have a good field of view, I believe. But you might want to Google fact check me on that one. Uh, Galileo was pretty interesting. Galileo uh, was a mission that almost failed because the antenna didn't open. But we were able to invent some uh, uh, image compression technology, which has made it its way into the internet, into your photos. Uh, so, so by by doing that, uh, this is a case where you know space exploration uh, has a lot of spin-offs into the technology that make your way into your uh, daily uh, home use. And then the first mission that I was ever on. Uh, because I was a multi-mission person, but uh, the first mission I was ever on was the Little Mars Pathfinder. And part, 
Mars Pathfinder and the so Sojourner rover uh, was the first time it was a, it was just a test, a, it, what's called an engineering test. If we could land and explore Mars with a rover, we could build a bigger model. So it was small on purpose, and we had to use a, a, this landing bag in order to get us down. And the first bounce of that bag was equivalent of the distance of the Empire State Building. And then it bounced and bounced and bounced and bounced and bounced and bounced and bounced. And bounced. By the time it stopped bouncing, we were kind of hoping to get close to a crater. We nailed a hole in one. <laughs> we landed in a crater. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was pretty cool. Uh, it, it, yeah, it was just close enough that you know we we could see it. And so we launched a little rover, and and this is what it kind of looked like. Well, it's my distinct pleasure to present to you <laughs> the first rover on the surface of Mars. The images that you've seen today show a completely deployed rover that has driven down a perfectly deployed ramp and gotten to the surface of Mars, making its first track in the soil of this new planet. And uh, to us, you know, it's opening a new era. <laughs> so that was that was an awesome mission. Uh, if you notice, that was a six-wheeled rover. And uh, if we have time afterwards, uh, we were trying to debate whether to use a six-wheel rover or an eight-wheel rover. So we made models of both, and it just so happened I brought with me the eight-wheel model, uh, and I have it over here. So you can, if you lay down on the floor, I'll run you over with it. <laughs> the actual real piece of NASA uh, historic hardware. Uh, so that brings us uh, into the near history. Uh, with SRTM, SRTM was pretty interesting too. Now this was where we actually flew uh, in a radar antenna, and here you can see the vertical exaggeration that I was telling you about. So you know this doesn't actually look like this, but by using the exaggeration, you can see it. No. No. Could you please? Mm -hmm. No good demo goes unpunished. All right, so much for SRTM, moving on. <laughs> uh, Genesis was uh, an awesome mission too. Uh, this opened up uh, these uh, aerogel packets inside these hexagons, and it was able to uh, grab solar wind particles, and then it was to deliver them to the Earth. Now, it actually, the parachutes didn't open. <laughs> Oops. And there was a couple helicopters. How this was going to work was uh, we didn't want it to touch the ground. <laughs> Oops. And the parachutes were going to open, and this thing was going to come very slowly. And we had this helicopter with this giant fork on the front, and it was going to snatch the spacecraft and cut the uh, parachute and then it was gonna gently bring it to a controlled area uh, for landing. But as it came in, it just kept coming in, kept coming in, kept coming in, kept coming in. Uh, turns out the failure was a sensor. Uh, when the technician mounted it inside the spacecraft, uh, there was no indications on which way to mount what side was up. So it never knew it was coming into, into Earth. Uh, so that was one of one of the problems uh, on that. Again, lessons learned. You know, let's uh, figure out what happened and what not happened. But uh, a lot of science did come out of this mission because we were able to uh, to gather the the parts the parts of it af afterwards. Then we uh, launched the Spirit and Opportunity rover. Uh, See if that'll play for me. Okay, so much for movies. It worked fine in the hotel room. Uh, deep impact, we sent a spacecraft to actually, uh, well, I hope this video works. Uh, this was really awesome because this was right on the 4th of July. <laughs> and, 
and, and you have a, an asteroid moving at the speed of a super bullet. You have a spacecraft moving at the speed of a super bullet. So what did we decide to do? We, we, did, we, we couldn't hit it head on. We wanted to hit it from the side. And so what we did is we had the spacecraft release this giant metal bullet, basically. And it would, on the trajectory, it would head and it would hit the asteroid while the spacecraft continued ahead of it. And it would film what happened as it went. So that was deep impact. No! <laughs> Tie dye. <laughs> right? <laughs> Didn't go. Now it should auto play. You know it's going to work as soon as I, this presentation ends. We're going to figure that out. Um, so uh, it's all up on YouTube. <laughs> Go on YouTube and check those out. Uh, so that, what's that? Yeah, well, you bet. I've already started it. Uh, uh, in 2008, we put a Mars lander, uh, lander versus a rover. The lander just plops down and it, it becomes a science station. And this was near the North Pole of Mars. And uh, we're going to launch another one called InSight. And InSight looks very much like the same heritage of this lander. Uh, but InSight's actually going to have a, a pro probe that's going to uh, uh, drill down inside. I'm going to try to see if this works one more time. Come on, baby. Okay, so we talked a little bit about today. So let's head off into tomorrow, what we have got going. So this is the InSight mission that I was just telling you about. Uh, InSight is, this is the lander. Uh, what's interesting about this is we're going to launch this item right here, which is a deployable drill. And that drill will bear down about five meters uh, into, into Mars. And we're going to put a seismic probe because we want to see if there's any Mars quakes uh, that are, that are going, going on and how geologically active uh, is, is Mars. So that's going to tell us a lot ab about Mars as well. And um, we also are working on a new Mars 2020 rover, which is very, very similar to the current Curiosity, except it has some differences to it as well. Uh, I'm very excited that I'm beginning uh, to work on this project as well as part of my, my day job. So there's a couple meetings I'm going to where I'm trying to facilitate how we do an operations plan. Presently, it takes our team about 10 hours to uh, to do a science mission. Uh, we want to try to cut that in half and make it about five hours and accomplish the same amount of uh, information. Uh, when you see uh, the Martian and you see all those uh, images of humans and habitats that are sitting on Mars, those are pretty. <laughs> but there's no real way to get them there. Uh, we have not come up with, other than landing a giant rocket, you know, like you would in 1950s um, Mars invasion, uh, right now there's, there's no real way to atmospherically get high tonnage loads down to the surface of Mars. So we did that small rover, we used the landing bag. Uh, so you saw that happen. But Curiosity was too large. Curiosity would have punctured all those bags and it just would have been a splat. So that's why we had this thing where it comes out with a parachute, slows down, drops this thing, uh, the lander, and then all of a sudden it 
chops the lander from inside, flies along on its own, and then lowers the rover, lands the rover, and this thing flies off. We can't do that with all these habitation models. So this is another uh, a real challenge with Mars. The one part that we, I really had a problem with the Martian was that hurricane storm right at the very beginning. Uh, because if that storm was going out there, you could basically just stand there in that 100 mile an hour wind and you could take a kite and the kite would fall on the ground. The reason is the atmosphere is 100 times less than it is on Earth. So if you have a parachute, it needs to be 100 times larger even if you have high winds. If you have a kite, it needs to be 100 times larger. So that's the problem with Mars, is the atmosphere is so thin. So we're working on a, on a craft, uh, which is this flying saucer, uh, that you're not gonna work for me, are you? Yes! All right, so this was a test. Uh, I paused it. Uh, this is a test where we launched this uh, and we fired those two starter motors that caused it spinning. Then we fired this main motor. This is above Hawaii, so you may see Hawaii down there somewhere. And we propelled this way, 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 way up, enough into space that it can turn around and basically re-enter the atmosphere. So it was a crazy ride. Uh, and what we did uh, to try to develop this, it's gonna be the first inflatable heat shield. Boom. So now we stop the spin and then deploy it back. So this is now a, a larger aerodynamic unit and then we deploy a, what's called a balut and a parachute and the parachute should work fine and not rip. Oops, it ripped. <laughs> so lessons learned. Uh, so we're gonna do it again because we're gonna try to figure out how do we get these parachutes? These parachutes are the largest parachutes ever made. And they're coming in at supersonic speeds. Yes, supersonic parachutes. That means you're moving faster than the speed of sound and you open a parachute. This, so this is rocket science. <laughs> <laughs> this is where it really gets hard. And uh, the only way you can, you can do that is to, is to just do it over and over until we finally learn our lessons and get it right. Okay, so we have a couple other missions that are gonna be Earth orbiting uh, as well. Uh, and then we are going uh, to Europa. Uh, Europa is very interesting because Europa is a water world. There's an ocean on Europa. The search for life beyond Earth begins with understanding life on our home planet. And that story, the story of life on Earth, may have begun in our oceans. And that's because, of course, if we've learned anything about life on Earth, it's at where you find the liquid water, you generally find life. So what if I told you that there is an ocean out there beyond Earth, an ocean in our solar system that what? has been in existence for billions of years. You're kidding me. It's an ocean that is perhaps 10 times as deep as Earth's ocean. And it's salty. It's an ocean that is global and may contain two to three times the volume of all the liquid water on Earth. It's an ocean that exists beneath the icy shell of Jupiter's moon, Europa. these worlds are yours except Europa. <laughs> now, personal opinion, I'm taking my NASA hat off. To me, it's not, is there life on Europa? Is, I want to know how big is it? And from FanFest, I like the comment, how does it taste? <laughs> so, no, we don't know if there's any life there, but uh, salty, warm, warm water, given a couple billion years all on its own, uh, we have found life on Earth that, that can uh, survive in these extreme environments, and we call them extremophiles. So within the last couple minutes, we've reached 
this is really an exciting mission. This is the asteroid redirect mission. So I'm gonna warn you now, I'm gonna go over a time, so I do wanna show you this. Uh, I'm gonna switch out of this presentation and I'm gonna go to my boss's presentation that he called Charts for Charlie. Okay, this is your standard PowerPoint, so yay, <laughs> I'm past that. Okay, so uh, th the asteroid mission, uh, this is, incorporates all the elements that you see there. Uh, it's going to incorporate not just the asteroid, but uh, the ability of Mars, uh, the moon, uh, the Orion crew vehicle, the International Space Station, multiple launch vehicles, uh, our deep space tracking system, and yeah, the SLS, baby. It's, that's our new high-powered rocket that's uh, currently under development. Uh, ARM, when we say ARM, ARM is actually uh, two missions in, uh, contained within this. It is the asteroid redirect mission and the asteroid uh, crewed mission. Uh, so part of it is we're going to devel develop this uh, space truck. And so I'm not going to go through walls of text about what we do. Uh, but again, it contains all of these elements of multiple launches, the crew uh, vehicle uh, going to Mars, um, and to the asteroids and as well. Now, why, why Mars? Because remember we said uh, we're gonna try to get those habitats down, like in the Martian, you see that one habitat? Well, this spacecraft is kind of like an, a truck. It it's basically has a, a, a base a telemetry system that allows us to navigate and, and propel through space uh, with a new ion engine. I'm gonna have a slide for that. Uh, but it'll allow us to take any 20 ton module. So what we're gonna try to do is capture a 20 ton boulder off the surface of an existing asteroid. So we're going to land this thing uh, down. We're gonna scout out a big enough uh, boulder. And then here's the tricky part. <laughs> we're gonna pluck it off the surface. Now, why is that tricky? Because this has no surface tension, okay? That, this is easy to grab and pick up. There's nothing here, nothing there. But a rock, what if that rock is the tip of an underground mountain? <laughs> Oops. <laughs> what if that rock is embedded, you know, deep in? <laughs> Oops. Uh, so we have all the, so now, now we have all the engineers and designers that are thinking all these what ifs. That's part of knowledge management too, trying to figure out what are all the cases uh, that are going to go. And then once they grab this, you can see the crew is going to come out there and they're going to look at it. So they're going to actually rendezvous uh, with the ARM uh, spacecraft. And we're currently putting uh, handheld uh, stanchions and uh, tool clips. Uh, on the spacecraft. So we have to fly the entire mission with these stanchions on there, even if the crew never shows up to our spacecraft, because we have to have those in place just in case uh, they do, they show up. So this is kind of the profile we launch uh, off of uh, Delta V, uh, or, or a large Delta IV heavy, or the SLS. Now we really want to do the SLS because that'll give us uh, an extreme amount of speed uh, uh, and, and velocity. And so uh, we'll launch this uh, towards the moon. We'll have this uh, lunar uh, orbit that we'll be stable in. And then we're going to fly to the near Earth uh, asteroid. Once we're at the near Earth asteroid, we're gonna figure out where do we grab uh, this boulder. And, uh, and then once we grab this boulder, we're gonna do something even cooler. So I'm so excited about this mission. All right, we're gonna use a gravity tractor. <laughs> what? A gravity tractor, does it say it on the slide? I can't, don't have my eye. Yes, no, but it's here. A gravity tractor, what it is is, uh, uh, I'll come back to that. Hold on. That'll keep you in this room a little longer. All right. So uh, 
Uh, then once we do the gravity tractor demonstration, we leave the asteroid and we come back to the lunar uh, space and then we park it into this orbit or we figure out what orbit we're going to put it into. Uh, it might take us a while to get to the moon, do a couple moon pass-bys, come way out and then achieve a, a stable orbit. Now that'll put the, the spacecraft and the asteroid together. And then from there we can launch the human crewed mission uh, to, to come up and then visit the, the spacecraft. So this, this has multiple phases to it. We have to approach the asteroid. We have to make characterizations about the asteroid. We have to pick out which boulder we're going to use. Uh, and then we're going to do this planetary defense demo by using this, this tractor beam. So this is what it would look like in space around the moon. Uh, that's the crewed mission uh, with uh, our ARM spacecraft. Uh, so that's ARRM and ARNC. And uh, the astronauts are already training for this. So our original concept, we were going to put capture the rock in a bag and then try to capture it. But the bag on the surface was some issues. So, so now we're using this ARM system. Uh, but back in the day, uh, we had to practice cutting open the bag and then looking at the rock. So the astronauts are already planning uh, uh, for this. Now, I'll get to the gravity tractor, but first let me tell you about an ion engine. So the chemical propulsion engines, your standard rocket engine, usually has maybe one or two propellants in it. Those two propellants interact with each other and it uh, causes your thrust. So you have a very small payload to a lot of fuel that you're carrying uh, in your spacecraft. But with electric propulsion, with a new ion engine, it separates all that. So you carry a small amount of propel propellant, you carry a power system that you need to grab you know, uh, the power that's going to cause the ion, ion. And then you can have a, a, a pretty good sized payload. Now, it, it doesn't look like it on the screen, but I actually took this PowerPoint and, and I moved this model on top of the other one, and it was basically four times. The, the payload is the exact same size green circle, but it's basically four times uh, the, the, is smaller for the same payload. And here you go. Here's, I could not show you this yesterday morning, but I can show it to you now. This is our new electric thruster, our ion engine that's presently in test. It is 18 times uh, the thrust uh, of the uh, Dawn mission. So this is our, this is our super uh, hot rod star destroyer ion engine. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Uh, yeah, and 23 times total impulse. So we can spurt it at impulse. You know, hear Captain Kirk you know, say, give us impulse speed. Well, when you impulse, we can get a little more uh, speed. Uh, now, it's very important to discuss about the, about, uh, you know, how's that, yeah, about uh, planetary defense. My favorite one is the, the dinosaur with the asteroid in the background, and they said, hey, dinosaurs, how was your space program? Not so good, was it? Uh, so here's, here's how the gravity tractor is going to work. So what we, what we do is we take, uh, we take the ion engine and we come, up to, uh, we come up to the asteroid. We land on the asteroid and we pull off this 20-ton boulder. Now, once we have this 20-ton boulder in our spacecraft, which weighs about, I think, 8 tons, we now have 28 tons of spacecraft and this giant asteroid. So what we do is we bring the asteroid very closely and all of a sudden the this, this spacecraft wants to land due to gravity, but something else happens. The asteroid wants to land on the, on the spacecraft. So what we do is we park it in this orbit uh, that's out here and and what happens is we use the ion engine to go away and the asteroid follows.
<laughs> I'm, on, I'm on videotape. Sorry, no streaming. It's Eve, you know, we do that. Oh, oh. Uh, it was a great job for a while. Uh, so <laughs> but no, seriously, that's, this may actually help us uh, with our asteroid defense. You know, goodbye, bad asteroid, that could kill us all. So, uh, so that's, that's what we call our, our gravity tractor uh, demonstration. Uh, and then, you guys love this. <laughs> so these new high-powered uh, electric propulsion engines, these space electric propulsion engines, will allow us to, to develop these modules, and this may uh, allow us to actually look into uh, asteroid mining as well. Uh, so, so there's a lot of advancements in the exploration uh, technology and experience that we're gaining. Uh, the mission highlights uh, of all of this is just, it, it, it's an amazing mission. It, we're bringing in the crude, uh, human crude program. We're bringing in uh, uh, all the technology. We're bringing in advanced physics, gravity physics, and so, and so much, you know, here's that, here's that circular orbit with, with pulling it away. And that could save all of us. That, 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 if we do nothing else, just that might be uh, worth it all. Uh, so, so you're going to see a lot more about this. Uh, again, this whole presentation was embargoed until yesterday. And that's all I have for you. If it's, if it's possible to have the l house lights all the way up, uh, I can I can try to field a few questions, and if anybody wants to be run over by the rover, uh, we got that as well. All right, uh, yeah, I'll just let uh, Charles... Or if you don't want to be run over, go walk up and take a look at the rover. I'll, I'll let Charles be the determiner of his own fate as to how many questions uh, that he wants to take, but I did want to thank him uh, for this cool stuff, and, and also for possibly saving all of our lives uh, with his out-of-game corporation. <laughs> thank you. Um, if, if there are questions, uh, I guess just kind of line up over here, or maybe if it's just you, I'll just give you the mic. When you talk about the future, like for example, the asteroid redirection, are we talking 10 years in the future, 25, like what is a real, a general time frame before something like that would actually be dependable? And um, I actually don't know the ARM mission timeline right now, so I can't address that. But I, typically, it's within, uh, you know, when we start at this phase, uh, what we're talking about, it's typically five or so years. But, but again, uh, there's more detail on the internet uh, now about that. So, so we're, we're trying to do this fairly quick. But yeah, within the next 10 years, we're, we're going to have, uh, have this figured out. You guys are doing so much really cool stuff. How do you inform everybody that this stuff is happening? Because you know that's the hardest be, part. I mean, like movies like The Martian comes out, everybody's like, yes. "Ooh!" But the stuff you're actually doing in real life is actually so much cooler than. I movie. find it so frustrating that I'm on Facebook and Twitter, and you know, I, and I'm trying to get the message out about some of the things. When CCP asked me, you know, can can you, can you give us a state of the fleet? That's why I jumped at this, you know, that, that, you know, there's so much going on. You almost, in the old days, we used to be able to look at, you know, our, our, our mainstream news media. You'd have Walter Cronkite, who was sitting there, who was a major fan of the space program, telling you about all this stuff. We don't have no Walter Cronkites today. So it's, it's hard for us to get this information out. You almost have to go get it yourself. 